All right, so let's get into it. The first vital sign that we usually always take is the temperature. Now, temperature is not new to any of us that um, have ever had mothers, right? Your mom will always take your temperature, especially if um, you have a fever or you say you're sick. It's usually the first thing that we check. So it goes under the tongue, you can do it under the armpit, and you can do it in the, uh, you know, the rear end, the, you know, the back end, okay? And um, that is really how we check in the hospital the temperature. Now, you can always, um, you know, there's, there's new technology coming out that check in the ear. They've had those around for a little while. There's a new one, though, that you kind of scan across the forehead and you go under the ear. Uh, I worked at a hospital in um, Orange County that had one of those, so that was kind of cool. But really, the most accurate one, the most accurate, is in the bottom, okay, in the butt. So, adults usually always get in the mouth. Um, adolescents usually always under the armpit. And any pediatric less than a year old always gets a red thermometer right in the bottom, okay? So if you're ever in nursing school, and you're gonna put a red thermometer in someone's mouth, <laughs> don't do it. Uh, I've seen it done before, and uh, all those red thermometers have been in someone's butt. So, it's kind of gross. But, okay, your normal temperature. Your normal temperature should be 98.7. Now that's normal, that's what the book says. That's normal, okay? Now, that's just really the average. Now that doesn't mean that it's normal for your patient. Okay, so the more recent books have been coming out and saying normals 97.5 to about 99.1. And this is really just the range of normal. Really just depends on how fast your patient's uh, metabolic rate is going for their body type. So are they really um, a person that you know, burns up a lot of calories or are they a person that doesn't? Now with your temperature guys, things that influence your temperature, one, always infection. Infection increases your temperature. So whether you have an infection in your toe, infection in your lungs, uh, infection in your skin, your cellulitis, anywhere you have an infection, usually if you just touch the site of the infection, um, it'll be warm. And once that um, infection really gets the bloodstream, your body will try to burn it up. And that's why we get a fever, okay? Um, one of the other things is um, septic, guys. If your patient becomes septic in terms of blood-borne infection. So your patient comes in with a urinary tract infection. Your patient comes in with a pneumonia, okay? Your patient comes in with cellulitis, just a bad skin infection that's just like tearing up their arm. Uh, your patient comes in with gangrene and their fingers are falling off, okay? It's not really, um, not uncommon to see in a lot of um, diabetic patients, so watch out. But, your patient comes in with an infection. And, say they're an elderly patient, so their immune system is already down, okay? That infection has now hit the bloodstream, and guys, where does blood go? It goes all over the body, right? Go to the heart, blood goes to the brain, blood goes to the kidneys, blood goes everywhere to give us oxygen and life, correct? Hopefully you know that by now, okay? Oxygen's a good thing, right? So, if you have a septic person, a blood-borne pathogen, that's you have infection all over your body and usually you'll have temperatures ranging uh, about 103, 104. Um, it can even, even get up to 105. Then the patient, uh, the patient, the body has like the certain mechanism in the hypothalamus that shuts your body down because it's getting too hot. So um, I always wondered why for the longest time um, patients will get really hot in sepsis, and then all of a sudden, boom, get like really cold, like 93 
or 94 um, temperatures. And I was always like, man, why is, why is that? Like, they've got really hot, and now they're getting really cold. So what happens is the infection has gotten so bad that it's gotten to the brain, the hypothalamus, and it turns off the thermal regulator device in the brain. So the brain just stops thermal regulating, as it should be, and it drops the temperature. And that's with sepsis, guys. So if you ever have a septic patient, yeah, they're going to be very hot, and you better start bringing down their temperature, or they're going to totally crash on you, and their temperature is going to take a dump, big time. So, we always, always, always get a rectal temperature on septic workups, okay? Now, septic workups have become big in the hospitals um, net nationwide. We have um, core measures, okay? Uh, standards of practice. Big fancy words for it's just a recipe. We want all the hospitals to make the same recipe. So, if we're making oatmeal cookies, we want all the hospitals to make the same oatmeal cookies, you know, the same amount of oats, the same amount of flour, same amount of eggs, same milk. We want them all to taste the same, okay? So whether I'm in Florida, or whether I'm in Nebraska, or whether I'm in California, and I come into the hospital for sepsis, I'm going to be treated the same in all those states so that we don't have any deteriorating patients or patients dying in other states compared to uh, patients living in other states. If that makes sense. So sepsis is becoming a more and more stressed thing in the hospital. So if you really want to impress your clinical instructor, uh, your patient comes in for a you know heart attack. Your patient comes in for sepsis. Your patient comes in for pneumonia or a uh, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Go to the charge nurse on the floor and ask her for the core measures. Ask them for the standards of practice, the best, uh, best practice, um, you know, little um, recipe sheet, I call it. And if you pull that, that's what nurses do. That's what nurses are encouraged to do. So if you're already acting like a nurse, your clinical instructor is going to be like, oh my gosh, like how did this, that's really good critical thinking. And it's like, that's what we should be doing anyways, because that's our recipe book. Now, I got off on a big tangent, but for one thing to remember, when you guys are doing your um, rectal thermometer with your red thermometer, you're going to be going up and, um, you know, invasively going into the rear end of a patient. So, do not, do not go into the rear end, do not use a rectal thermometer for chemo patients, okay, or basically patients who are undergoing treatments um, to get rid of new cells. Now, why don't you do rectal thermometers on chemo patients? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. So, you don't do rectal thermometers on chemo patients because chemotherapy is really supposed to kill off what? What is chemotherapy supposed to do? What is it supposed to do? That's okay. Chemotherapy is supposed to kill off new cells, okay? So, cells that grow the fastest, like tumor cells, we'll say, it kills it off. So, the tumor shrinks. But chemo is not specific in terms of what kind of cells, it's just killing all the cells that grow. So that's why we get alopecia. All of our hair falls off because those new um, dying skin cells, they just basically just fall off. So our new uh, epithelium layers that are growing, our new skin is very, very, very weak now, especially in the lining of our rectum. So apparently when we used to do rectal thermometers uh, for patients who had already a very, very low blood counts because we're killing off all of the new uh, blood cells and the white blood cells with chemo. So the patient's immune system is pretty much gone. We have no way of fighting an infection. So they come in with the temperature, okay? Patient's on chemo. 
Okay? They might have sepsis. Holy crap. Sepsis says, best accurate temperature we're going to get in the butt. It wasn't until a lot of patients were being perforated in the uh, intestines when we were doing too many uh, rectal thermometers. And basically, um, how do I say this? Popping a hole in the rectum, pretty much. Kind of bad. Not a good day, right? <laughs> Not at all. So that's where all this crap comes from in terms of all of your standards of practice, all your standards of care. Um, you know, nurses have screwed up in the past, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not their fault that they screwed up because there was no standard of practice in place, but that's why we have these standards of practice in place for you guys to know that you do not do a rectal thermometer in a chemo patient who might be septic and have a high fever, because you might perf the bowel, okay? You might pop a hole in that rectum or cause some skin damage, skin integrity, and then we have a way worse problem, okay? So hopefully you, that makes sense a little bit. Um, when would you use an axillary temperature? Now axillary goes right there, right under the axilla of your armpit. Do you only use them on kids? Do you? Do you, do you, do you? Not necessarily. Um, if you haven't been in the hospital a lot, or if you haven't been in a nursing home a lot, um, you'll soon find out when you get in the field uh, during your clinical rotations that not every patient is a walkie-talkie. Not every patient um, you know, gets up and walks around and talks. A lot of patients are altered, altered level of consciousness. A lot of patients um, have type, some type of brain issue or whether it be dementia, or uh, Alzheimer's, or some type of brain damage, or maybe they are they have some type of neurological disease like MS, ALS, um, myosthenia gravis, or, or whatever, whatever you have to. Um, and they can't function their mouth. Then we just do a armpit temperature. Armpit temperature is like the least accurate that you can do. Um, you know, the, the, um, the rectal one's the first, the oral is the second, and then axillary. It's kind of, I mean, you know, you only can take what you can, um, you take what is available to you, right? Um, so if your patient's altered, or if you get a patient, like I do all the time, uh, a patient in the ER um, that rolls up with multiple gunshot wounds, or uh, we had a stabbing last week, and the patient is altered, basically uh, knocked out, not responding, barely responds to pain when I rub on his chest, um, then yeah, I'm going to definitely do a axillary temperature. That's just to say if he's not profusely bleeding and hemorrhaging all over my ER bed, which really we're going to go into next, the heart rate, why the heart rate goes up, then I might do a rectal temperature. But you have your PO, rectal, and axillary. And guys, know what to use and when. So hopefully this video helped you just a little bit.